All right. I've got a long uh, kind of intro here in terms of uh, numbers of scriptures, so we'll have to take a little bit of time getting into this, but uh, it's, it'll be worth it because I want to be able to bring some of these things out. And uh, <clears throat> we're talking about everything being by grace. You know, by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. I was thinking about Abram. Uh, the Bible says Abram believed God, and God counted that as righteousness or declared him righteous simply because he believed God. Now, later, God asked him to do some things. So Abram responded. But Abram was righteous simply because he believed. Amen? He, had, he believed God to be faithful to his word. And God said, you're righteous. So I, I want to, you know, I'm coming from a Jesus name, one God, Pentecostal background. Holiness, I mean, you name it, you couldn't be any more legalistic than how I got saved. But I got saved the same way everybody else in this room got saved, regardless of, you know, what your background is. We got saved because we believed in Jesus. Now, that all played out in a lot of different ways. But the truth is, we all believe the same thing, or we wouldn't be saved. We wouldn't be believers. Now, that's what I want to talk about, because we all do come from different backgrounds. And more people that come, they'll come from different backgrounds as well. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying here. Because I, in all honesty, I cherish my roots even though there was some error and, you know, all of us, I mean, come on, if we are honest, no religion has it all together. This is about a relationship. So we can all find flaws if we want to spend the time to, to begin to, you know, kind of dissect every denomination. <clears throat> There's plenty of there to spend the rest of our lives fooling with, all of them. That's not to put them down. I'm not trying to demean anybody or diminish, you know, any of that. I'm just saying there's a pure gospel, and that's what we need more than anything else. Other things are approaches. There are things that we do, but there are things that I, I, I want to talk about this morning. And uh, if you'll give me the freedom to do that, amen, the Holy Ghost does, so I just will. Praise the Lord. I'm not, I'm not you know, denying the Word of God. I'm saying we, we take it in a context based on where we are and what we're thinking and what we've been taught and so on and so forth. You know, I said this many times, so at the risk of boring you to death, I'll just repeat myself. But when I resigned my uh, license and dropped my license with that uh, particular organization, who I still have many friends in and, and still have great respect for much that they do, I, dro I, I quit renewing my license because... The Lord told me that unless I went back to the Bible and read it as though I'd never read it before, I was never going any further than where I was. Now, I didn't understand what all that meant at the time, and there, it's been a weird trip when I left to where I you know, find myself today. But I'm beginning to understand a little bit more about what God was saying. If somebody would have asked me then, what does God mean by that? I don't know that I could have described it or explained it to you. If I had, it would have been in error probably. I think I know more today because I, I mean, I know more about what God meant by that today simply because of the journey. I mean, simply because of where we are now, I understand some of what he was trying to get across to me. I wouldn't have been able to accept it then. You know what I'm saying? Any more than you can just come up and give somebody revelation and expect them just to throw their hands in the air and say hallelujah. It's revelation to you. It doesn't make it revelation to them. It may just be a slap in the face or an offense to them. So we have to realize that when we're trying to lead people into this relationship with God. And I'm talking about just into a message of grace. So, you know, Sally asked me the other day, and it's not the first time we've had this conversation, but why don't, why isn't our church, why isn't this church, when I say ours, I don't mean Sally and mine, I mean ours, why isn't it, why isn't it grown? Why isn't it full? You know, why isn't it 
this or that or how come some other church does this or has this or whatever. I never like that conversation, so I very rarely give her much feedback. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because I don't really know. You know, we've done everything that other churches do for the most part. I mean, we've knocked doors. We've handed out tracts. We've had tent meetings. We've done all kinds of stuff. And uh, pretty much what anybody else would do. Bible school, giveaways, bicycles. You know, I mean, we've meals, free, come just eat and, you know, fishes and loaves and all that stuff. So I don't have an answer for that. All I know is just I just do what I feel like, you know, the Lord leads and it's up to Him. And that's part of what I'm talking about here this morning as well. But that's not, it's more than just what this body of believers is about. It's about each one of us individually and how we present Christ and what our expectations are when we do that. How many of you have ever been disappointed by a witness to somebody or trying to lead somebody to Christ and they just pretty much spit in your face or, or at best maybe just kind of rolled their eyes and walked away from you or were polite and just never responded, you know? Well, if that happens to you individually, you can imagine that's what happens collectively because it happens to everybody. And, and so this is part of what I, I you know, have, have been thinking about. And over the years, I'm going to take one message. It isn't the only message. It's just a message, okay? And I, and I don't want you to misunderstand that I'm trying to d belittle the message. I'm just saying our concepts of these things are misunderstood many times, taken out of context, and therefore, they don't produce what it is we're really wanting to produce. So anyway, all right, let's, go to, let's start with this. Matthew chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. I'll over-explain and have you totally confused. Sometimes, you know, I, uh, you know I'll, I'll teach a message or preach a message, and I'll think, man, that was, that was the best. I don't mean it egotistically. I just mean I just feel like that made sense. You know, that connected dots. And to my amazement, people will just kind of look at you and go, hmm, praise the Lord, you know. And other time, and I, and it's not that it depresses me, it's just that I think, what didn't, what am I not saying, or how come I'm not presenting it in a way that they're getting what I'm getting? You know what I mean? Because other times I'll preach something and I think, well, that, you know. You know, it's all good because it's the Word of God. You know what, you understand what I'm saying? But you just have a sense that some things have a greater impact than others. And a lot of people come and say, man, that was powerful, you know, that just really touched me. And I'm thinking, good. I don't know what I, don't know what I said because it didn't do that much for me. But So it isn't, there's an there's a idea that, you know, somehow we can just say things and because it's true to us, it's going to necessarily have the same effect on everybody else. Okay, I'm still trying to over-teach here. But here's Matthew chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. For whosoever hath... To him shall be given, and he shall have more. Abundance. Praise the Lord. But whosoever hath not, from not let's back up just for a minute because you might miss that. Whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Not just more, but more abundance beyond the initial whatever it is you got to have to survive. Here we're speaking in terms of of. of spirituality, revelation, so on and so forth. But it can, be, it can be anything. Whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. We're still talking revelation here. Which is everything that this is. That's all this is. You read the book of Revelation, and it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. But that's what the whole Bible is. Not just that one book. It's all revealing God and how God then re relates to man. Right? So therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing, ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes. Everybody say, my eyes are blessed. 
Praise the Lord. For they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. The truth is, until Jesus, this revelation or manifestation of God in the flesh, until he came, the prophets never got 90% of this stuff. They were prophesying, but they didn't know what they were prophesying. I mean, under the in the context of when they spoke it, they were, whoa, you know, really, they were special, holy. But the truth is, based, you know, compared to us, they didn't know anything. They wanted to know, and they spoke of things that they wanted, that, that, that God had given them, but they didn't really get it. They didn't really have the whole picture. They didn't really understand it. So here he's talking to religious people. This is Jesus, and he's talking to these religious people, but he says, look, uh, they don't hear, and they don't see. Why? Because the main revelation here is God in Christ. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to you know, be confrontational. I'm saying grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, today, even now, not, we, we can move ahead 2,000 years from when Jesus is saying this, and it's still true that without a revelation of grace, our ears are still closed and our eyes are still blinded to the truth. We're still trying to do what was being done when those prophets were speaking. I mean, we're still trying to keep rules and laws and religious uh, traditions that have nothing to do with, with what God was trying to reveal to us. All right? Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 and 12, or 10 through 12. Now, Paul is speaking to Hebrews. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews. He's not speaking to Gentile believers or unbelievers. He's speaking to Jews. And he says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Somebody ought to say, Praise the Lord. That's the message. That's the new covenant. All right? Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 10. And we'll go clear through to through 23, Sheila. Beginning at verse 10. Chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. We just read who's sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Now he's, he's again quoting Isaiah, which is what he just did in chapter 8 as well. Saith the Lord, and I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter... Now, Paul is, he, he's still, this is, you know, we got chapters, but Paul was still having the same conversation with the same people. It just happens to be in our book, in the Codex here, 10 or, or two chapters later. But when I'm talking to you, I don't divide it up into chapters. If somebody was writing it down, they might. But it's just one conversation, right? So here he's repeating this. Where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let me go back to chapter 22 because we'll come to this later on. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's just talking about the flesh. Now, here's what, here's what he's saying. We have baptism. And obviously, baptism is symbolic. It, baptism doesn't save you, but it is symbolic of what Christ has done. What Christ has done is wash our bodies. In other words, our flesh, even though it is still defiled, it isn't being judged anymore, okay, because we are in Christ. So your actions or your deeds, your works, are not, not being measured or judged as a believer. It's been washed. That's what baptism is about, okay? And, how, and, and the fact that it's, you know, we say, well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we say in Jesus' name, it's the same thing. If you, if you understand, <laughs> do all that you do, do it in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. God manifested in the flesh. He has all these names right here. We can show them to you. But he chose a name to truly reveal who he was, and that name is Jesus. That's why we don't baptize in the name of El El, you know, Jehovah, right? So you understand what I'm saying? I'm not, again, I'm, this is not, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm just trying to ex, just explain something, all right? So our bodies are washed with pure water. We'll get to it in a minute. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, all right? Well, how do we hold fast to the profession of our faith? Well, the profession of your faith was you profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's your Savior, right? That's what we got to hold on to. What we just read. That we are saved. That we are sanctified. That we are perfected. That is the profession of my faith. The profession of my faith isn't what I've done, but the profession of my faith is what he did. So I have to hold on to this. In other words, I've got to live the rest of my life in this body who I see as being dirty, but God says it's been washed. And my profession has to agree with what God has said. Otherwise, I'm confessing a sin consciousness that it's not who I am. conflicts. It causes us to become neurotic Christians at best and schizophrenic at worst. Double-minded, exactly. So he is faithful, the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, that promised that we were sanctified, that promised that we were perfected, that promised that once and for all our sin has been dealt with. Praise the Lord. Again, by grace are you saved through faith. Now let's think of the, the way that's said. By grace you're saved. So you get saved by grace, and it's through faith. This is what he's talking about right here, the profession of your faith. You were saved by grace, but it's through faith. Your faith doesn't save you. You were saved by grace, but it operates through faith. Now, the good news is, it's really not even your faith, because unless the Spirit draws you, unless He deposits faith, which is Christ in you, it's the faith of Jesus, then, you, then this is all mute. I mean, it means nothing. It, won't, it, can't, it can't accomplish anything. So here's, here's what I'm saying. The gospel message goes out. 
And according to Matthew 13, according to Jesus' own words, some hearers respond with faith in Christ. And some people simply can't hear. I, you know, some of you may have, uh, may, maybe have known the Lord ever since you were a child. Others, maybe you went your whole life and you really didn't. I mean, it isn't like you never heard a message. You just never heard it. You know what I mean? You, it, it, maybe when you were 20 years old, you finally heard it and you responded to it. But it isn't like it wasn't ever said in your presence. It's just you just didn't hear it. It didn't resonate. You, you didn't accept it. So that's, that's what he's talking about. See, it's only by grace that some do hear. I, don't, I can't take any credit for it. For me being saved, it's only the grace of God that I did hear. Blessed are the eyes that see and the ears that hear because the Spirit of God has opened them to do so. The power in the gospel isn't the dynamic presentation. Now, believe me, there are people that believe that that's the case. If you're dynamic enough, if you're quote-unquote anointed enough, then people will respond. But it the dynamic presentation of the gospel is not the power of the gospel. The, the, the preacher or evangelist and their presentation is not the power of the gospel. Your sincerity or your winsomeness when you, when you witness to somebody, that's not the power. Because if it was, there have been times when you've been very sincere and yet, no response. It's not that, I'm not saying that the Spirit doesn't empower us and use those things, preaching and witnessing. I'm just saying the, the way we do it is not the power. The power of the gospel is the Spirit applying the saving work of Jesus to the heart of the hearer. The power of the gospel is the Spirit of God applying the finished work of Jesus to somebody's heart, to somebody's innermost being. Now, let me read something that Charles Spurgeon said. And... Uh, and I agree, so. For at least here, Charles is right. He said, you cannot induce them to come. Now, this is a great preacher who won many, many, many people to Jesus. Everybody's heard of Charles Spurgeon, right? You cannot induce them to come. You cannot force them to come by all your thunders, nor can you entice them to come by all your invitations. They will not come to Christ that they may have life. Until the Spirit draw them, come, they neither will nor can. Now that's coming from a guy who packed out auditoriums year back before there was all of the technology that we have today. Those are his words. So, let's look at something here. And again, this just happens to be a message. I'm not, I'm not singling this out except that I'm familiar with it, and I've studied this for years. So let's look at Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, and we'll just go 14 through 21. Now, this, this is the first sermon that Peter preached. In fact, it's the first sermon that has been preached or was preached after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, after he went back into heaven, right? Everybody with me there. So, and it's Peter that's preaching it. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now I'd like you to, I don't know how many of you have read this or heard it read to you many, many times. Well, let's just look at it like we hadn't heard this message before. Okay? 
Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now he's talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit because Joel prophesied it. And, and he's just saying these people are staggering around, they're speaking in tongues and, and they're not drunk. This is, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. This is the prophecy of Joel. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. Praise the Lord. Now, Peter begins this, this first Christian sermon with the majesty and the powerfulness, almighty God. Amen? If there, if there, he says, if there is speaking, if there is prophecy, if there are miracles, if there is power, if the sun is darkened, if there's blood and fire, where does it all start? God. Amen? That's what he's telling us. This is the majesty of God. This is the power of God. This is the Almighty that's in charge of all this. So Peter's saying, God prophesied. God said, this is going to happen. And now he brought it about. He's setting them up. He's saying, look, God prophesied this. Here it is. This is the fulfillment of God's prophecy. We know Joel said it, but it was God's prophecy, right? So basically what Peter is saying is, all that you understand about the prophets, all that you understand about the miraculous works of God, all that you understand about how God moves is wrapped up in the Godhead. And all of the Godhead is in Christ. And Christ is in us. Amen? The fullness. So all that you understand about the miraculous works of God and all that you understand about how God moves is wrapped up in the Godhead who saves all who call on Him. Praise the Lord. He saves this Godhead that He's talking about. He saves everybody that calls on Him. Anybody that will call on Him. All right? So now let's look what He says next. Uh, verse 22 through 36. Now this is, this is for me, right? I've been, <laughs> praise the Lord. I've been trying to figure this out for a long time. And I'm, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but at the same time, I, I want to, I want you to see what I see from what I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to get us to understand. We got to look at this as though we'd never seen it before. We all come with our own preconceived notions or religious traditions. I'm just saying this because, hey, where I come from, Acts 2.38, you heard it in every message. I don't care. It was in every message. So... I'm not denying that it's true. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying let's, let's, whatever yours was, amen, there's, there's just a lot of stuff out there in the Bible that we're reading through, through prisms, through, through religious glasses that make us see things in a certain way. And God wants to give us revelation. Revelation not about us, revelation about Him. So you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Everybody say a man. Amen. Praise God. A man. This is a guy that walked with him, talked with him, ate with him, denied him, saw him after the resurrection. A man approved of God 
among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Rest. Amen? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance or thy presence. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this, back up. Oh, she, I'm sorry, okay. He seeing this, I'm sorry, Sheila, I thought you had gone and it was still 31. That's all right. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up. Whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed for this, forth this, which ye now see and hear, which is the Holy Spirit operating. Amen. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, so we've got this incredible sermon about grace. If you can see it. And it's tying God's work in the incarnation of Jesus back to the promise of the Old Testament, specifically David's promise of an eternal kingdom. God cannot lie. Whatever God says, it's going to happen. But here Peter says, but you crucified him. He's telling this is the fulfillment of God. This is God robed in flesh. This is the fulfillment of all that prophecy, and you killed him. You crucified him. You did it. But grace. Now that's offensive. You try winning somebody to Jesus with that argument. It is the argument. It's still the argument. But it's offensive. It offends people. But it's grace. Can you see that in this? You killed him. We aren't ever going to make Christian or Christianity so cool that everybody wants it. We're never going to make it so intellectually satisfying that everybody's going to be embracing it. Every effort to remake Christianity, every effort to adjust the gospel so that it appears more appealing or more acceptable is foolishness. It's grace alone. I don't care if, if we're coming from a liberal theology or a conservative theology. Their only play in their playbook is either let's get rid of the atoning work of Jesus Christ because it's separating us from other faiths, or let's give man a greater role in what he does to bring about salvation. Let's save Christianity by changing Christianity. 
All right, now let's go on from Acts 2, 37 through 41. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We killed him. Now they're pricked in their heart and they say, What do we, what, what, what do, we do now? The Holy Spirit has dealt with them. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, change your mind, and be baptized, that washing, <coughs> excuse me, of the body that he talked about in, in Hebrews, that Paul spoke of in Hebrews. <coughs> change your mind about God. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the, gift of the Holy Ghost. Now remember, these are Jews. And he's telling them, you've got to change your mind about the law. You've got to change your mind about your concept of God. You've missed it. God has been here, and you killed him in the person of Christ. And he's saying, now you've got to change your mind. You've got to quit thinking the way you've been thinking traditionally and religiously, and you've got to understand that there's something happening here that you don't have any control over. Remember what he said? When, when Joel made the prophecy, and then, and, and then we see it, uh, Paul trying to explain then this new covenant, what does he say? Your sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. You've been justified. You've been perfected. Not by your works, but by this sacrifice, this one sacrifice. And then Peter said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Again, nobody comes except by the Spirit. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Praise the Lord. So, they just preached the gospel. And the response was, what do we do? You change your mind. You get baptized. Now, here is the rub. That's not the gospel. It's what they did in response to the gospel. The gospel is the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the acceptance of God, the reconciliation of God. But it's preached as though it were the gospel. And not just this. I mean, we, you could pick a denomination and you're going to get a tradition that's taught and they're going to tell you that's the gospel. It's not the gospel. It's their response to the gospel. And their response was, they had faith that God was going to redeem them or reconcile them. That was their response. Their faith in grace was the response. Praise the Lord. Again, I'm only using this because this is where I came from, okay? But you can, I, I, could, I could pick any other number of, of denominations and, and, and use their quote-unquote, candy stick, but the, what I'm saying is no action brought about their salvation. Nothing that they did that day brought about their salvation. It's what they understood Jesus had already done that brought their salvation, and they exercised faith in it. They believed. Only faith in grace They hadn't fed any poor people. They hadn't visited any widows or orphans. And actually, except for what Peter's saying, they hadn't been sitting under any teaching. They hadn't been going to church. They hadn't done anything but hear about grace, the grace of God. 
the mercy of God. He's all powerful. He's majestic. And you're sinners. That was the message. He's great. And you killed him. You're sinners. He's God. But in Christ, you can be reconciled to him. That's the message that Peter is preaching here. See, we look at it. Now, I'm just saying for me, okay? Others may have gotten this, and I'm just dense. But I saw it, and I saw it as here are demands being placed on me. That's not what Peter was preaching. Peter spent all this time with Jesus. Grace and truth came by Jesus. Peter wasn't preaching that. Peter was trying to get them to understand all of your laws, all of your rules, all of your all of the demands. They're not, this is not what this is about. God has come in the person of Jesus Christ. And you killed him. But he's not mad at you. If you'll believe in his sacrifice, he'll not remember your sins and iniquities anymore. You'll be reconciled to God. Every, there'll be peace again between you and God. It's the only message of the Bible. It's grace is the gospel. Praise God. When they heard this, God's majestic. God is all-powerful. God is everything. And you're sinners. But in Christ, you can be reconciled again to God. And they were moved. They were pricked in their heart. Not because of God's anger, but because of God's love. Because of God's compassion. They responded with saving faith. See, Acts 2 actually takes us back to the truth. The truth is, we simply have to tell them. We don't have to make them do something. We don't have to put them under a guilt trip. We just have to tell them, look, God's everything. He's all-powerful. He prophesied. It comes to pass. Blood moons. Everybody's freaking out about blood moons. God said it. We expect it. It's going to happen. He said it would. But He loves you. And all you, if you'll just believe in the sacrifice that He made through Christ, you can be reconciled to God. You can be one with God again. You can be at peace. You can rest. God does the opening of hearts. God opens minds. And now that is freedom. Think about it. He said, uh, Jesus was talking about the, the fact that it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Well, now, I had a problem with that when I would read that or hear it preached. It wasn't the goodness of God that I was hearing. I was hearing the anger of God. The judgment of God because I was, I killed him. And I did. I was guilty. I was as guilty as anybody. But that's not the message. The message is the goodness of God in spite of all this. He loves us. And he gave himself for us. I couldn't have killed him if he didn't let me. You know what I mean? If he hadn't given himself up. The reason I say that there's freedom in that is because it takes the pressure off of our presentation. And I can tell you, when I first came to Iowa, after I was licensed, I wasn't ordained. I mean, I wasn't, I was ordained. I wasn't, uh, you know, uh, there's like three different steps in the organization and all that stuff. And I went all the way through the whole thing. But I'm saying when I first came here, I had, a, I had what was called a local license. And the district here allowed me to come and start a church, even though I only had a local license. And then, I don't know, six months later or so, I got a general license. You had to take tests, and there was stuff you had to do. But anyway, they, they had me come. And, and uh, 
I, I, I really believe this. I believe that the more passionate I was about what I was teaching or preaching, the greater impact it had. Now, the sad thing about this, I was, a, I was young in the Lord. I had only been saved for three years when I, when I was licensed to preach. The sad thing about it is not my ignorance, but the fact that there were men standing on platforms with me that had 30 years of experience that should have been far more mature, and they believed the same thing. And I'd work myself up into a frenzy, you know. <laughs> and sometimes they were impressed. And tell. Out of ignorance, I preached a message on grace one time at a church right here in Des Moines. I didn't even know. What I was saying wasn't right. I mean, according to the. But I mean, it was at a it was at a, a regional thing or a sectional deal. I can't remember now, but there was, I know that the, there were like six, eight other pastors on the platform, including the pastor of the church that I was preaching in. And to his credit, he was he had some health issues at the time and asked for prayer later. The rest of them avoided me like the plague. And I preached on the woman with the issue of blood. But I preached on grace. Because I thought, that's what I see, you know. I mean, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be saying that. But I'm telling you, I got the, I could feel the temperature on the platform drop. It was just icy, you know. And I'd look back, and, I, and they, I, they were just looking at me like, you, you, you blasphemous dog here, you know. And it took, me the lo- it took me a long time to figure out why. I mean, I didn't, I, th- I, didn't, I didn't disbelieve the other things that I believed. I just believed that, too. I'm just saying, this Bible is a message of God's love. It's a message of grace. And it takes the pressure off of us. It isn't my presentation. It isn't your presentation or your sincerity. It's the Spirit of God. Our only responsibility, the only thing God wants us to do is tell Him the truth. Represent me honestly. I mean, come on, let's face it. That's what religion, where religion had failed. They had presented God in such a twisted and, and hateful way that when He shows up, Nobody recognizes him. And all Jesus did was reveal the Father. He said it himself. I only do what the Father does. I only say what the Father says. And it was so bizarre to the religious people of that day that they called him a blasphemer and a devil and everything else. And here it was God. He was only doing what God does. He only said what God said. So sometimes when you come to religious people and unsaved people who have this same kind of image of God because that's what's being projected out there most of the time, no matter how... I mean, I'm I'm still amazed by people... Those of you that saw that video on uh, uh, Father of Lights, you see these Christians, sincere Christians out there, and here's their way of witnessing and bringing people to Jesus. God's judgment's coming. You know, he hates your sin. You, the sinner. And get ready, because you don't get right with God, he's going to get you, and you're, you're just done. And they asked, they asked the guy, they said, well, why, the, and he said, you know, what about the love of God? And he said, well, this is the love of God. It's God loving them to get them to stop doing what they're doing so he doesn't have to kill them. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. But that's not not the Bible message. That's a religious message. And, And what this is telling me is that the Spirit 
See, the Spirit isn't involved in a misrepresentation of God. Jesus could not have been anointed and operated the way he did if he wasn't truly and perfectly representing God. So if there's a breakdown in this manifestation, if you will, of God in terms of healing and deliverance and salvations and everything else, maybe it's because we're not revealing him properly, purely. You understand what I'm saying? And the freedom comes as a result of me knowing it's not my presentation. It's not how charismatic I might be or how, you know, uh, what oratory skills or what have you. It's just the truth. If it's the truth, the Spirit of God will draw people to it. But God has to do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. We just present it. And we ha- if we present it in love, if we present it in a way that it's true, it's, it's the grace of God, it's the love of God, then God will bring people to him. We, see, I used to think you had to be able to explain everything. You had to be able to do it absolutely. You had to be able to do it completely. But the more older I get and the more I read this, the more I realize I just don't know it all. You know, we learn, but the more we learn, the more we realize what we haven't known. So God's not asking us, if, if, if we had to have the message perfect, nobody would ever get saved. I got saved with a flawed message. I didn't get saved by the message, I got saved by the presence of God. I thought it was the message, and I tried to keep the message instead of developing the relationship. I don't have to argue or defend creationism. I don't have to argue against materialism or the new age. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just saying I don't have to be able to have the perfect argument to defeat that. I don't have to be able to overcome other people's denominational teaching or traditions. Because I'm saying that in the end, it's God who opens eyes and ears. Our responsibility is to tell them. It's that simple. And some people don't like what you tell them. Well, what else is new? It's always been true that some people don't want to hear this message. It was true in Jesus' day. It's, it's always been that way. But some are going to hear And those that do hear will be saved. The spiritual power in the gospel is denied when we add to the gospel. Or when we adjust the gospel, it becomes no gospel. Am I saying the other things that that Peter said weren't true? Of course they were true or they wouldn't be in the Bible. But that's not the gospel. The gospel was in what he said. It's the grace of God. God still loves you. God still reads you for you. God still wants you. And that's what the people responded to. When we doubt that message, when we doubt the message alone, that grace alone is the power of God for salvation, we start adding to it or subtracting from it. It's inevitable. Paul said, this is the power of God unto salvation. He was talking about grace. So whenever we deviate from that, whenever we try to add to the message of grace, this goes to what was being said here at the very beginning. Grace is it. The finished work. You can't minimize it. You can't even overemphasize it. You can try, but you can't overemphasize it because it's everything. So no matter how hard you try to make it more, you'll never be the end of it. You'll never get to the end of how big it is. 
And the moment that we try to diminish that or change that or add to it or subtract from it, we end up missing. It's become a power of pre- presentation or power of persuasion. And we start trusting in ourselves again. Now look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 121. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. (laughs) Praise the Lord. They don't know it by intellect. They don't know it by wisdom. They don't know it by just much learning. After in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So we end up agreeing with God, but we disagree that preaching is required anyway. In other words, we need to preach it, we need to witness, but we need to do the truth. And you don't get it through intellect. You you won't convince people just through intellect alone. It has to be by the Spirit. You preach the unadjusted gospel of grace, and then it becomes an empowered gospel. Then it becomes powerful. We measure things by uh, our emotions and by our intellect. God doesn't. That's why you had people uh, in, in the beginning of the Pentecostal movement here in the United States uneducated. They weren't orators. They were farmers. They were whatever. And one guy preached with his head in an orange crate in Azusa Street because he was so embarrassed to get up in front of people. But people were filled with the Holy Spirit. People got saved. And this message of the finished work of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, for the forgiveness of sins and the securing of eternal life, It happens by the Spirit. Amen. The Spirit that has given eyes to see and ears to hear. You know how many times I heard that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? You know how many Sunday school classes I set in and the little pictures that I looked at of Jesus knocking on the door and and the coloring books and the... uh, Vacation Bible school. I, I went to all that stuff when I was a kid. In a very nominal, but a Christ-believing church. It never impacted. I knew that there was a God, but that was it. I was 30 years old in southeast Texas, drinking a quart of vodka a day, and God knows how many drinks along the way in the bars and so forth, smoking pot, selling axles and hubs and drums to stock trailer builders and ranchers. Drunk all the time. So drunk that you wouldn't have known I was drunk unless you saw me sober. We went to a Pentecostal church that preached it hard and fast and, you know, all that stuff. And God spoke to my heart. I couldn't have told you what the message was the night that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know what I'm saying, their doctrine. Something happened. And I heard him for the first time. I saw that he was real. And he saved me. Now, to my embarrassment, I thought it was the church that saved me. I mean, I knew it was God, but you know what I'm saying. I thought it was the things that we did. But I remember them asking me about being baptized in the name of Jesus. I said, sure. Whatever. Because I was already saved. You understand what I'm saying? I, I, I didn't care about anything. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Fine. 
I knew something that had happened that had never happened to me before. And I'm not saying that I had never prayed because I had many, many times. I can remember it goes through my mind right now. The different times in my own mother's house in the living room. Nobody else is there. I come back from Colorado on heroin. All screwed up. Relationships all fouled up. And I can remember getting on my knees and praying. Nothing happened. I'm not saying God wasn't reaching for me. I just, I was blind. I was deaf. I couldn't hear. I couldn't see. Now, it wasn't because all of a sudden I became a better person. Somehow the Spirit moved. And I responded to that Spirit. And my life has never been the same since. It has been perfect, but it's never been the same since. Because I know deep down inside something happened. And what happened was I accepted Christ in a way that I'd never been able to do before. And why do we want to put people through all of that stuff that most of us went through in our journey to just be with Christ? To just have the relationship with Jesus and not have to deal with all the guilt and the shame and the embarrassment and all the other things that happen along the way after being saved. Look at... uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. Now this is, we just heard that it's by the foolishness of preaching. We preach not ourselves. That is in my presentation. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Just Jesus, period. If we confuse the gospel with the response to the gospel, we alter what makes it clear and personal. This is a personal thing. It's not a program. You can't give somebody just three steps to follow and then you're saved. Or do this thing and then you're saved. It takes the personal aspect of this out of it. This is personal. And when we take this out of the gospel, when we take that response that people have to the gospel and call that the gospel, then we've taken the personal aspect of it away. I see it like this, and I've, I've thought about this many, many times. I, man, I'm telling you, I would run the aisles. I would leap with the best of them, shout, speak in tongues, and all of that. I can still do it now. There are times when I feel like I probably should, but I don't. Well, I don't know. It's pride or whatever it is. I don't know. But, man, I tell you, when I first got to say I did it, I did it all. And I wasn't ashamed. I was showing God, look, I don't care what people think. I'm going to prove to you. I'm going to show you it's okay with me. But that wasn't my salvation. It was me responding to salvation. So when people fall out in prayer or shake or jerk or do whatever they do, okay, I'm I'm cool with that. But that's not the gospel. That's them responding. That's not God. It's them responding to God. And it's okay. But we don't want people to think that that's God or that if you don't do that, you don't have it. You see what I'm saying? When we start adding to it or subtracting from it, we, we, we screw it up. There's nothing wrong with our response. There's nothing wrong with being excited and, and being even overwhelmed at times with the presence of God. That's fine. But we can't, I mean, I came from a place where if you didn't do that, you were being critiqued all the time. What's wrong with them? What kind of sin are they into that they can't feel the presence? Amen? This is personal. And because you're not the same person I am, your personal response to God is going to be your, and it should be pure. It should not be judged or criticized. It ought to be honored. That's how God made us. 
Praise God. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 through 47. We'll hurry up and finish. It's almost noon. And they, uh, that's right, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in baking, breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. That word fear is actually awe. And all that believed were together, and all had things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread, and from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, uh, how many of y'all, you know, uh, some there are some that have. Let's just let's just say that we're just crass. Okay, so we got different people in the church. Some people have uh, X amount of money. Another person has. Minus X amount of money. Is God saying then that that person with X amount of money should just come and give everything? In other words, give that other person as much as what you got. So you don't have more than they have. <laughs> well, only if you're the one that's getting, do you believe that? Praise the Lord. Or there, But there are some churches. Here's my point. My, my point is this. All that's good. That's okay. Give to the poor. Fine. Fellowship with one another. Eat meals together. Do all this stuff, right? But if we're not careful, the next thing you know, we'll be doing a bunch of different stuff that actually obscures the gospel. Come on, I mean, look. You go, go to church and they'll tell you, this is what you got to do. You gotta give this. You gotta quit the, you gotta go and do all the time. If you're not taking care of this, if you're not taking care of that, all of a sudden that's the gospel. That's not the gospel. I'm sorry. It was their response to the gospel. But it was their response to the gospel. It's personal. That's why I can't command. That's why I can't dictate. That you do thus, 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 and thus. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it or that it isn't a good thing. I'm just saying I'm, I, I, God didn't give me that role. And he didn't give it to you either. The message is the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit then lead them and guide them. Because what we're doing when we do that, when we start saying, well, you got to give to this, you got to go there, you got to take care of this thing, you got to take care of... All of that's good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, that those things aren't good. I'm just saying that you end up doing exactly what many, many traditional churches do, and that is God saves you, and then immediately they begin to tell you what the Holy Ghost says. Don't look like that. You've got to change this. You've got to look like that. You've got to dress. And all of a sudden, the gospel is totally obscured. And now we're calling something that is not the gospel the gospel, which is why we have no personal intimacy with God. Because it doesn't matter if it's just out of ignorance. It's still being done. We still end up putting stuff in front of the gospel. And only when we call it, well, the Holy Ghost led him to do it. No, it was peer pressure for crying out loud. You, you have to be an idiot to not know that. It wasn't like, whoa, God's sending me down here to do this. No. Everybody's expecting me to go do this, and if I don't do it, they won't like me anymore. Right? They'll ostracize me. They won't have nothing to do with me anymore. Well, I've just lost the benefit of what I did do because there's no reward in, in doing something out of fear of punishment or ostracization or something. It's only what we do in the Lord. So unless the Lord moves you to do it, you can do all you want to, but it's filthy rags. Everything else, that's what he tells us, everything else you do is garbage. Now, I know we don't like to hear that. Are you saying that I shouldn't help the poor or help the, the, the shut-ins or help the this or that? I'm not saying anything of the kind. 
And I'm saying that if you're just doing it because you think that's your responsibility as a Christian, then it's garbage. It's your righteous acts, and God says your righteous acts are filthy rags. I'm just trying to be honest. I'm just trying to present the true gospel, not what you think is the gospel, not what you were taught was the gospel, but what the Bible says the gospel is. God bless you if you are a doer, 